Hello, Nia Fitzpatrick here. As part of the Healthy Ireland at Your Library initiative, we're going to talk today a little bit about my book, Tell Me the Truth About Loss. On March 13th, 2017, I went to bed and I had four siblings. It had been a normal day at what seemed like the start of a normal week. The next morning, Tuesday 14th of March, I was woken by a phone call to say that essentially one of those siblings was missing. My sister was Captain Dara Fitzpatrick and she died alongside the crew of Irish Coast Guard Helicopter Rescue 116. And I remember even now, three and a half years later, that moment when we heard that Dara had died, it's as if our lives, I think, were hit by a train. It's like being hit by a train. That's probably one of the best ways I can describe it. And it's like your whole life is thrown up into the air and, you know, your life comes down and hits the ground in pieces. Some pieces are there still, some are missing, but all are scattered. You know, the life that you knew and the life that you had before is gone and there's a new life in its place. Around the time that Dara died, my marriage was ending. And for me, the loss of my sister and the loss of my marriage was immense. It was cumulative loss and it was immense. I had already come to terms with a few years ago not being a mother and not going to be able to be a mother in life and that's another loss and I suppose losing my sister, losing my dream to be a mother and losing my marriage just were huge losses in my life. Um, and what I found is that I'm a psychologist by profession but I found that my lived experience of loss and grief are very different than what I had expected from what I knew from life as a psychologist. Grief isn't my area of expertise or wasn't my area of expertise, but I still would have known enough about it really from my profession. But I just found that when I'm living grief and as I'm living grief, it's very different to how I, I suppose, expected it to be or thought it might have been. And that's probably the reason that I wrote this book. Because when I began to speak about grief, I found that um, other people seem to resonate with it and say, gosh, I'm feeling that too. And it struck me that so many of the aspects of grief are overwhelming and they're overpowering and they're confusing and they're bewildering. And it's just such a complex and difficult emotional state. And that's probably why I agreed in the end to write this book, because I thought it was worth putting down onto paper some things about the truth about loss and the truth about grief because they may well help other people as they helped me when I learned them along the way. The first thing I noticed in terms of the impact of loss really after Dara died is that the impact was emotional. So, you know, I might have expected beforehand that the first impact I would have felt emotionally would have been sadness, but actually it wasn't. It was numbness. Um, I just felt for a long time as if I was living behind a glass wall and I could see life going on the other side of the wall, but I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't feel anything there for And I think the numbness and the shock that we experience sometimes around loss, that's our body's way of protecting us. Because to try and understand and process and deal with the enormity of the loss all in one piece, it's just too great for us. And I think sometimes we can become numb just to let the enormity of loss if you like, be processed in small pieces. It's like we realize it bit by bit by bit, and that's more manageable than understanding all in one go the enormity of that loss. And so emotionally, I found I went from shock and numbness to sadness, to rage, to resentment, to loneliness. You know, really emotionally, loss is not about stages at all. Um, some people suspect that it is and you know it's maybe a myth really that idea that grief is going to be about stages it's not about stages it's about lurching for me anyway it's about lurching from one emotional state to another and often back again and it's just so messy and it's so difficult physically was the thing that probably brought me the greatest surprise really um, I found after Dara died that I began to get colds and flus. I was eventually hospitalized with pneumonia. I was exhausted all the time. Um, I didn't sleep for months and when I did sleep I had nightmares. 
um, I just think that what's happening there physically with us is loss is so great. It's so huge that the effort that it takes to actually learn to live with it and to process it and to deal with it is so huge that physically it takes it out of us. So it's almost like think of grief as being like an app on your phone that drains the battery. You know, there's nothing left for anything else. And so that's why in many ways, I think physically it can impact us in terms of that exhaustion. And for me, as I said, it impacted in terms of my immune system too. Cognitively grief impacts us as well. So I found that I found it hard to remember things or I found it hard to concentrate. I put something in the dishwasher that should have gone into um, the fridge and vice versa. I just cognitively was probably less present for a while. And again, that makes sense. You know, my brain was trying to figure out how to learn to live with the loss of Dara. And that's huge energy that it takes to do that. So cognitively, I probably wasn't present for other tasks or other situations in some regards because I was trying to deal with that. I think really uh, it's safe to say that over the last three, three and a half years, I felt as if grief was going to break me because it impacts us physically, emotionally, cognitively, as I've said, also socially, perhaps financially, practically in every way. It's just an onslaught. It's an overwhelming, bewildering, confusing onslaught. And there have been times over the last three years at the loss of Dara, the loss of my marriage, that I actually thought I would break in two. And one of the truths about loss is that it is utterly awful. It's truly awful. Another truth about loss is that we can survive it. I find myself here three and a half years after Dara's death and I'm surviving. Physically, I'm still a bit of a mess. My body hasn't quite recovered, but I can do something about that. But I am surviving and I think that's important to note. So what helps me survive or has helped me survive and is helping me survive? Well, one of the first things that's really important is I think I understood grief from the start. Not actually funny enough from my psychology background, but I understood it because I went looking for information from lived experience, people who had been on that path that I am before me. So one of the things I did was what they tell you not to do. So I got on to Google. Uh, this was a few days after Dara's funeral and I just started Googling grief. And I came across a woman called Megan Devine. She was a psychotherapist and she suffered loss in her own life and has gone on to written a book called, to write a book called uh, it's okay that you're not okay. Now, I haven't read her book yet because I didn't want to be influenced by somebody else's book when I was writing my own. But one line that night, way back when I was Googling about grief, one line from the book popped into Google and it just struck me. And that line is that some things in life cannot be fixed. They can only be carried. That I thought was game changing for me and that it helped set my expectations from the start because I knew right away that I wasn't going to be able to fix this. There was nothing I could do to fix it. I couldn't fix my pain or my family's pain, but I was going to have to learn to carry Dara's loss. And I suppose as an expectation, that was really helpful because I never wasted time trying to do something that really I was never going to do, which was to fix this. Somebody else then sent me a link to something on YouTube that's worth looking up. If you go onto YouTube and you look up BBC Life Stories Grief and you'll find there there's a psychologist and she draws a circle and she says within this circle is your life. And then she gets her pen and she draws lines across the circle and she says when somebody dies we, knows, we know that it impacts every part of your life, every corner of your life. And the lines across the circle are to represent that. It's the, the, the death, the bereavement, the loss in your life is impacting every corner of your life, every part of your life. What we used to think was that over time, that grief piece for the person who has died or the loss in your life, that, that would reduce. But now we understand that actually what happens, and then she gets her pen again, and she draws a wider circle outside the first circle, because what happens is we grow our life around the grief. So 
it's understanding and I think it's really helpful to understand that what we will do in time is we will begin to grow our life around the grief. You know, grief is not about closure. It's not about moving on. It's not about coming out the other side. It's not about getting over it. Grief is about learning to live with the loss. And when we learn to live with the loss and as we are learning to live with the loss, what we do is we actually grow our life as we're ready. We grow our life around the grief. So we hold the pain for the person who has died or for the loss in our life. But we, in time, at the same time, can go on to live our life. And it's not moving on, it's going on. That's really important distinction. Something else that helped me besides understanding grief was knowing how I felt was normal. So part of that Googling that I did was I found a response from an old man to a query that somebody put up on the boards, Reddit. Somebody had put up, my friend has died, I don't know what to do. And this old man came on and said, I'm an old man, I have no children, but I've had lots of loss in my life. And here goes, I'm going to try and explain it to you. And he talked about loss and grief as being like a shipwreck. shipwreck. And the ship has wrecked and you're in the water and you're holding on to your life and the waves are coming over you and they're 100 feet high and they're 10 seconds apart and the waves of grief crash over you and you can't catch your breath. And that's actually what it feels like in the beginning. That's exactly what it feels like in the beginning. And I thought it was interesting to understand that and to know that how, was, how I was feeling in those early days was entirely normal. And what this guy who put the reply up in Reddit says is that at some point the waves become further apart. And instead of being 100 feet high or 80 feet high, they become 50 feet high and 40 feet high. And at times then you become able to anticipate the waves. So you might know, for example, that an anniversary or a birthday or just some day where it's something that you used to do something together, those times can hit harder. And that life that we grow around the loss reduces down and the loss becomes the biggest part of our life again, then again for a while. And I think that's really important to understand that, to understand the ebb and flow of the waves, to understand reducing the life uh, sort of comes right in down and the grief piece becomes the big piece again. They're really useful to understand because it helped me know that how I was feeling was normal that I wasn't doing it wrong or I wasn't not coping. This was entirely normal and this is what grief feels like. And there's a lovely expression from Viktor Frankl, which is that an abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is normal behavior. And that piece there around finding myself crying or finding myself irritable or uh, lacking motivation or anything like that, Things that wouldn't normally have been me, they were okay because this situation wasn't normal. So I couldn't expect my behavior or my feelings to be normal around it. And that's okay. So an abnormal situation, an abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is normal behavior. Really useful to remember that and to know that because what it does is it helps you understand that how you feel in loss is normal and that's okay. Something else I think that was really important for me was to actually feel those feelings of loss. So whatever I felt, even the ugly feelings, so the rage and resentment, the loneliness, all of those things, we have to feel them. And I think probably as a psychologist, I knew that and I lent into those feelings. I didn't back off them. If you think of a tube of toothpaste, you know, with the lid on top, an old tube of toothpaste, that was a metal tube of toothpaste, not the current plastic ones and if you keep that lid on and you keep squeezing well that toothpaste is going to come out the crinkly bits on the side our feelings are the same they come out somewhere we have to feel them we must allow ourselves to feel the feelings and there's no denying them or masking them or numbing them with substance or anything else what we have to do is allow ourselves to feel the feelings and I think I probably did that from the start and that really helped me along the way Something else that's really important was understanding that there's no expiry date with grief. So there's no situation where it should be, you know, that you're sh you should be feeling okay by a certain date. 
it's grief is really individual. It's about going at your own pace and doing it in your own way. And it's not about being over it. As I said, it's about learning to live with it. And everybody will do that in their own way and at their own time. And I think that really helped to understand that I didn't have to go to anybody else time scale on this. I could go to my own time scale, however that was. That really was helpful because grief is really complex and messy. So sometimes it hurts when you can't stop crying, but then it hurts when you do stop crying. It's as if we need the pain because the pain becomes a connection to the person who has died. And I think for all those reasons, we will ebb and flow and we will take our time and we will struggle with it, but that's okay. And understanding that is a really useful thing. Something else I think that's really important is I chunked things down. So the idea of sort of living with my whole life without Dara or spending my whole life without Dara was and perhaps even still is too huge. So I don't deal with it in that size of a chunk. I don't think of my whole life. And in that first year after Dara died, I didn't think of the whole year. I didn't think of Christmas without her. I just got through each day and I said to myself, put one foot in front of the other and repeat and get yourself to bedtime where you lay your head on that pillow and then we'll worry about tomorrow when tomorrow comes. And that piece of chunking it down, small manageable pieces, only dealing with the piece in front of me, that actually was really helpful because before I knew it, one day moved into the next day into the next day and I found myself getting through the first week and the first month and the first six months and the first year. So chunking things down into small manageable pieces. And even in terms of thinking of Christmas, when I did get to Christmas, I used that strategy, I suppose, of chunking things down again in that what I did was I said to myself, I know Christmas is about family and ritual and nostalgia and everything like that. But Christmas Day is also just about uh, that day Christmas, that year Christmas was a Monday. So I said to myself, Christmas Day is also just about a Monday and a big chicken. And there was something about that by chunking it down into simple chicken dinner and a Monday that allowed me to be able to navigate that first Christmas without Dara. So I think if you can think of that piece of chunking things down and not looking at too big of chunks in your life, that can really help when it comes to navigating loss. The other thing that's really useful to do is to practice self-care, extra work on the self-care when somebody has died and you're bereaved. And by that, I mean looking after four main areas. So your sleep, your food, your movement, fresh air, exercise, and your connection with other people. So it's looking to say to yourself, you know, what are the things I can do that are gonna help me in this regard? And perhaps if you think of it as, I'm going to mind my body so that my body can mind me. The reason I'm putting this point in it here is I failed at this miserably. I did really good on the emotional self-care. I stayed away from toxic people. I was okay with saying no. I didn't overload myself or expect too much of myself, but physically I didn't do the self-care well. Um, I probably kept working too hard. I didn't eat well. I didn't exercise because I was so tired. And so really physically I got that bit wrong. If I was to go back and do it again, I would say to myself, even though you're tired, just walk for 10 minutes and then turn around and come back and walk back. But I suppose I just missed that piece. And that's again, that's OK with me. I was dealing with cumulative loss, huge, enormous loss. And something had to drop, I suppose. And if it was that one, that's OK, because I'll get there in the end. I'll certainly be physically where I need to be. But just maybe if you could learn from my mistakes and do that little bit of extra practice around self-care and see what you can do to mind yourself, especially physically, it will mind your body which will allow it to mind you, as I say. Something else that definitely helped was that I gathered support. So we don't have to pathologize grief. And for a lot of people, they won't need any psychological support through it. For me, I did, and I'm okay with that. So I went to see a psychologist who helped me with trauma and loss and 
really learning to navigate those first, first days and weeks and months after Dara died. So I would say if you feel that you need help, it's OK to reach out for that. And the Irish Hospice Foundation are fantastic. They do a lot of work in Ireland with um, the dying and with those who are bereaved. And so they would have a list perhaps of bereavement counsellors that you could go to. So if that's something you feel is for you, then think about that. But the support might not be professional support. It might be personal support. So if you can find people in your life who are going to be OK with you in pain and emotional pain, they're the people you want around you. Somebody sent me a beautiful card and it said, if you cannot look on the bright side, I will sit with you in the dark. When you're gathering support, when you're bereaved, find the people who will sit with you in the dark. Find the people who won't try and, you know, make you feel better or hurry you along, but who will just allow you to feel your feelings whenever you feel them. They're the people that you want in your corner. The other thing I did that was important was I kind of didn't make it worse. So the expression I use on this is, if you cannot make it better, at least don't make it worse. My last birthday before Dara died was the July. Dara died in March and the July before then, something happened on the morning of my birthday. I got into an arc about something and I ended up not seeing Dara. And I have a twin sister and she was with me, so we didn't see Dara. And we didn't know then, but because of my narc, that was the last birthday. We had already spent the last birthday we would ever spend with Dara. We missed that chance because of me, because of how I was. Now, I can spend my whole life giving out to myself about that. I can spend my whole life feeling guilty that because I was an idiot that day, that my twin sister never got to see Dara one last time on her birthday. But that's just going to make things worse. That's not going to help anything. And so for me, I think it's important to focus on what are the days that we did have together? What are the times we shared over the years? And there is a choice in that. It's not an easy choice, but there is a choice on that. And what we can do is we can choose to not make it worse. If we can't make it better, at least don't make it worse by focusing on what you wish you had done and what you wish you hadn't done. Instead, look at what we do have. Look at what we did have. It's really important really helpful, not always easy, but it certainly is possible. Something else that helps for me anyway is finding some meaning out of the wreckage, really. And I think understanding that I can do some good out of a situation and a loss that is truly awful. So, for instance, some friends of Dara's and pre-COVID, they organised a run, a memorial run, on the um, airport runway in Waterford. And knowing that charities benefit in Dara's name, that really helps. Um, even talking for me, talking about grief and talking about my struggles around grief and having other people say, oh my gosh, I'm not doing it wrong or I'm not not coping. I am normal, this is okay. That's something that comes out of the, this, I suppose, that brings meaning to it. And it doesn't change things. And I would want Dara back and I would have Dara back in a heartbeat. But if I can't do that, then I think to bring some meaning to the situation by helping others or doing some good in Dara's name, that's something that can really help as well. I suppose essentially for me, how I coped was I was kind to myself. I never beat myself up. I never compared myself to others and I didn't expect to get through it on my own. You know, I, I took that professional and that personal support and guidance. I allowed myself to stumble, to fall down, to mess up. I felt the feelings. I didn't avoid them. And I think all of those things really have helped me over the last three and a half years. Because for me, if grief had a goal, it would be to help us get to a place where we can achieve a balance between remembering and living. So understanding that we can remember the person who has died and we can live our life. And that's sometimes the big struggle in grief because it can feel difficult. How can I laugh when Dara is not here? How can I plan? How can I hope? How can I dream when she's not here? There's something in my head up to a point that really struggled with that. And then maybe over time I learned 
that I could do that. I learned that it was okay for me to laugh and at the same time to remember Dara and at the same time to grieve Dara. They aren't mutually exclusive. And so I think that piece of learning to carry the loss in our lives and also to be able to live our life, that's really important. And I want you to know that that is possible, that you can remember the person who has died and you can live your life. And my experience is that once we get to that place, actually, there's a clarity in our perspective that we have on life that you just don't have before. Um, and I think that's something that's worth remembering and understanding that there is a life after awful and that you can survive your awful of learning to live with the loss of a loved one in your life. Um, and that with that new life, what can come is extra clarity, extra perspective. I know that I can say no now. I don't feel the need to please people or to be liked. Those things don't really matter to me in the way that perhaps they might have mattered before. And I think really that truth that I said earlier is really important that loss is truly awful. That's one truth. Another truth is that loss is survivable. And I want you to know that and to understand it and to remember that we are so adaptable as human beings. And it's such pain because people sometimes say to me, oh, you loved your sister. And I say, no, I didn't. I love her. It's present tense. It's not past tense. And so the love you have for the person who has died is still there. But it's just that that person isn't there to experience that love. And that's the struggle. What do you do with those feelings? But I want you to understand that it is survivable. We can survive loss and we can learn to grow our life around the loss and we can learn to carry the loss and we can learn to survive the waves. Part of that is about feeling the feelings, understanding grief. It's about being kind to yourself and it's about chunking it down and it's about not making it worse and all of those things. So what I would say to you is whatever the loss in your life, and wherever you are on that path of loss, I wish you peace. I wish you well. And I hope that you learn to balance remembering and living so that you can remember the person who has died. And at the same time, you can live your own life. Stay well. Thanks for watching.